Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this webinar on litigating trade remedies. Uh, I'm Daniel Merlo, for those who haven't met me before, a director in the trade and regulatory group at Thiel Fisher, and I'm delighted uh, to be joined by two very distinguished barristers today, uh, Sarah Lee, QC of Brick Court Chambers, and Tom Sebastian from Moncton Chambers. Sarah is a competition regulatory public law and EU practitioner who has acted in a number of challenges to Ofcom and has a strong interest in trade remedies and in te telecommunications, utilities and industry generally. Amongst other things, Sarah has in the past acted in a judicial review related to government's oil stocking regulations. And Tom Sebastian is a barrister at Moncton Chambers. He has extensive experience uh, in the area of trade remedies. He has acted for exporters and, and investigating authorities in numerous investigations, including in the EU, uh, the US, India, China, South Africa, and South Korea. He's on the Attorney General's Public International Law A panel and regularly uh, advises UK uh, government departments, including the UK's Trade Remedies Authority, the TRA, on trade law matters. So welcome to Sarah and Tom. Uh, speaking for myself, I joined Phil Fisher about six months ago uh, from my previous role at the Trade Remedies Authority, where I was head of litigation and head of legal team. And in that role, I uh, helped to establish the, uh, the litigation team and was lead lawyer on um, the first, uh, a number of the first trade remedy investigations by the TRA. I joined Field Fisher to build up uh, trade remedies practice, among other things, uh, drawing on our tier one public law practice and our strong litigation group, advising companies uh, in various industries on trade remedy investigations, and hopefully um, also litigation as and when it arises. So we thought it would be useful to run um, a webinar outlining the essentials of litigating trade remedies, uh, given that a number of the first uh, transition reviews um, have come to an end or are coming to an end, uh, and the possibility of litigation is therefore on the horizon. How it will play out, of course, in practice remains to be seen, uh, but we thought it'd be useful to talk through some of the main aspects to help you have a good overview of what to expect and to help you prepare. So, can we move on to my first slide, please? So, uh, just waiting for the first slide to move across. I'm not sure what's happened there. Um, so, my first slide is really just an outline uh, of today's um, uh, session. So, firstly, I'll be speaking about um, the what, the who, and the how uh, of appealing. Uh, so um, looking through the regulatory framework uh, for about 15 minutes. After that, um, Sarah will talk about the public law nature of the uh, appeals processes, which I'll expand upon in my part to uh, give you uh, some context. And then following uh, Sarah's part, Tom will talk about some practical considerations relating to the appeals, which will hopefully um, give some food for thought and then after that we'll have a Q&A session. So we'll take the questions at the end but there is a questions, um, one opportunity to ask questions through the, the, the tech here so please feel free to stick those in uh, during the course of the presentation and I'll uh, marshal those as we go through. Okay so um, if we could go on to the, the next slide. Just want to check that the slides are moving because on my screen it's remained the same. Um, but uh, so, uh, I, as I mentioned, I'll be speaking first. And on the very first slide in my talk, um, it's just a reminder um, that uh, the process of a of a trade remedies um, investigation or a or or a review, a transition review in, in this case, uh, will be. The review in the investigation first and then that will be followed by um, a potentially a reconsideration uh, and then following the reconsideration um, uh, an appeal so it's a sort of um, three-stage process now that's in relation to um, appeals against decisions of the trade remedies authority um, but when it comes to appeals against the decisions of the secretary of state uh, for international trade which can also be appealed, as I'll come to in a bit. Um, those don't follow the 
uh, reconsideration process. So those will go straight to appeal. Um, <clears throat> now, I think it's just important to note at this point that, as I mentioned, there are two. There will be two different decisions that will be appealable: uh, the recommendation by the Trade Remedies Authority and the uh, decision um, of the Secretary of State to accept or, or reject the TRA's recommendation. So that already adds a layer of complexity to to the litigation. Um, also worth bearing in mind that it's not only investigations that can be appealed, but but also reviews, including of course transition reviews, which are uh, the mainstay of the TRA's work at the moment, but also, for example, expiry reviews, interim reviews, uh, new exporter reviews, uh, and so on. So moving on to my next slide, uh, this is just a reminder um, about uh, the two-step process, um, as I mentioned, uh, relating to appeals. So the structure of the um, reconsideration appeals process was designed so that decisions of the Trade Remedies Authority following uh, investigations and, and reviews uh, firstly uh, need to be um, reconsidered if parties are unhappy with that decision and that's an internal reconsideration that happens by the TRA itself and uh, once the TRA completes the reconsideration process it will issue a reconsidered decision and that decision will either uphold the original decision or vary it according to what the, what the TRA has found as part of its uh, reconsideration process. So uh, that's the first part. Um, once the uh, reconsidered reconsider decision is issued, that decision then becomes the appealable decision. So it's only once you've gone through the reconsideration process in general that the appeal process um, can take place. The, the one key exception to this, of course, is if the TRA, for example, refuses to uh, reconsider a decision, then that will automatically become appealable. So that's one way of avoiding the reconsideration process for decisions of the Trade Remedies Authority. Okay, so uh, turning to my uh, next slide, um, just to um, reflect briefly on the reconsiderations process. So uh, I don't want to dwell on that in, in, in this talk, but there are already uh, two reconsiderations uh, um, underway um, by the Trade Remedies Authority. So the first one is a reconsideration of the Steel Safeguards Transition Review. Uh, and the second is the reconsideration of the um, welded tubes and pipes uh, transition review that uh, both of which um, were started in, in kind of late autumn last year and those are ongoing. So the outcomes of those reconsiderations by the Trade Remedies Authority will lead to the issuance of a reconsidered decision and it's that decision that will then become appealable. And as I mentioned, just to note that this process of reconsideration only applies to those decisions of the Trade Remedies Authority. So decisions of the Secretary of State to accept or reject the Trade Remedy Authority's decisions don't have to go through a reconsideration process before they become appealable. Okay. Okay, so turning to my next slide, um, back to appeals. Uh, just here flagging um, the relevant uh, frameworks. So uh, the principal regulatory scheme is the uh, uh, reconsideration and appeals regulations, and these set out the, the relevant legal framework. So um, in essence, setting out uh, who can appeal, which parties are entitled to appeal, which decisions can be appealed, um, the nature of the appeal, uh, the fact that it's conducted by the uh, upper tribunal, and the potential outcomes of uh, the appeals. Uh, and we'll look at those in a bit more detail uh, after this slide. Just worth noting that, um, as I mentioned, the, the appeals will be to the upper tribunal. That's the tax and chancery chamber of the upper tribunal. Um, and the tax and chancery chamber uh, here hears appeals and reviews from a variety of different um, bodies, including um, HMRC and the Financial Conduct Authority. So presumably um, it was thought by those who designed the, the uh, appeals scheme that it was the most appropriate forum uh, for appeals of trade remedies decisions. And also, I suppose, relieving the High Court from the, the high burden of the number of judicial reviews that it, it hears. Um, the upper tribunal, in terms of the, the process uh, for the appeals themselves, 
applies the upper tribunal rules, um, which I've just referenced here, and uh, as I, we'll look at some of the kind of key provisions of that as well in the next few slides. So, uh, turning to my next slide, uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, what can be appealed, well, um, uh, Regulation 17 of the, the Reconsideration and Appeals Regulations I just mentioned, uh, it, sets, it refers to uh, those decisions which can be appealed. Uh, so, the scheme is, it essentially identifies uh, a list, a long list of decisions that are appealable. And uh, those are actually contained uh, at the back of those regulations and schedules one and two uh, of the rec reconsideration and appeals regulations. And as I say, um, appeals must be against reconsider reconsidered decisions of the Trade Remedies Authority in the main. Um, and unless that process has been followed, the appeal right won't arise. Or, as I said, um, you can directly appeal decisions of the Secretary of State um, without having to go through that reconsideration process. Um, now, which decisions, I mean, as I say, there's a very long list uh, to look, look at. Generally speaking, uh, the decisions that are appealable are those that bring an investigation or, or a review to an end, or, or indeed at the front end of uh, an investigation, a decision not to initiate, for example. Um, so this relates to decisions that bring to an end investigations uh, or reviews uh, equally. Uh, but also contains uh, reference to decisions to suspend measures, for example, or decisions not to accept undertakings. Uh, so um, it's always necessary to check um, that the decision that you want to challenge is appealable, is, is contained within that long list in Schedules 1 and 2. Um, but absolutely the case that um, the TRA's recommendation following a um, transition review and the Secretary of State's decision as to whether or not to accept uh, the recommendation by the TRA, both of those are appealable decisions. So the TRA's recommendation will have to be reconsidered first and then falls um, for uh, appeal. And as I mentioned, the, the, the Secretary of State's decision will automatically become appealable without that recommendation, without that reconsideration process happening. Okay, so um, just turning to my next slide, in terms of who can appeal, so, um, it is only uh, interested parties uh, who can appeal. Um, now, that is a defined term within um, the regulations. And in general, it's um, in, in most cases, it is um, any interested party to a particular investigation uh, or, or, or review who has the right um, to issue an appeal against one of those reconsidered decisions. There are some exceptions. Uh, so. In, in, in the circumstance where a party uh, applies for a new investigation and the TRA refuses to initiate, then um, only that party who's applied, which makes sense, uh, has the right to uh, appeal that decision of the TRA. Now, <clears throat> when we consider the fact that in any interested party can generally uh, appeal the decision of the, the Secretary of State, uh, that means that there are obviously quite a few parties who, who could bring an appeal. So, Interested parties covers, um, you know, relevant governments of the countries from from which the you know, specific goods are being imported, uh, the overseas exporters, um, producers, uh, importers of those goods, the UK uh, producers of the light goods, or in the case of safeguards, the directly competitive goods, and trade associations um, of of those of those producers and exporters too. So there is a there are you know interested parties covers a number of different. Um, potential uh, appellants. And so um, it's worth just noting uh, that there will be a number of parties who will be um, involved in the litigation because not only will there be someone, the appellant, who's unhappy with the decision and therefore wants to appeal it, but there will be other parties who are happy with the decision and therefore will oppose the appeal. Now, obviously the appeal will be against the Trade Remedies Authority uh, or the Secretary of State, but there is scope for those uh, other parties who are in favour of the decision to participate. And uh, Tom uh, will talk a bit more about that uh, in his, his segment. So taking together the fact that we have lots of potential parties who could be involved in, in any one particular appeal, and the fact that there are already two decisions that are potentially appealable, that is the decision of the Trade Remedies Authority following its investigation, and the decision of the Secretary of State um, in terms of whether to accept or, or reject the TRA's recommendation, 
already demonstrates that the litigation uh, that's likely to follow is, is going to be quite complex. Okay, turning to my next slide. Um, so this is about the public law nature of, of the appeals. And this is really a critical uh, aspect that I think um, I really want to focus on. I'm just going to mention it here and Sarah is actually going to uh, devote her segment to this because um, this really uh, defines the nature of the appeals processes and the way the, way the appeals will, will, will happen. Um, so just to flag, um, the reconsideration and appeals regulations stipulate that the upper tribunal, uh, when hearing an appeal, has to apply the same principles as it would in a judicial review. Now, what does that mean? Um, it means that this isn't an, an appeal on the substantive merits of the decision um, of the Secretary of State. Oh, just thinking where we are in slides terms. Can we, um, I think a couple more slides on, just appeared on my screen. Um, so, uh, it's not an appeal on the merits specifically, but it has to be an appeal based on one of the uh, main public law grounds of challenge. So I've listed some in, in the slides, but um, I mean, principally, um, it, it, the key one would be potentially irrationality or Wensbury unreasonableness. So again, Sarah will talk a bit more about this, but in order for a decision to be challenged, the ground would have to establish, here we go, just previous slide there, um, that, that would have to argue that the decision by the Trade Remedies Authority or the Secretary of State is, is unre Wensby unreasonable or, or irrational. Um, alternatively, it could be argued that the decision um, goes beyond the powers, ultra vires, uh, of uh, either the TRA or the Secretary of State, or that there's been some sort of procedural impropriety uh, in the investigation or the, which has led to the decision or mistakes of fact that have led to some sort of unfairness. These are really important to uh, kind of understand uh, because, as I say, appeals have to be um, made through these grounds and Sarah will elaborate on these as her part of the talk. So I'll leave it there for now, um, but just please keep that on your in, in mind when thinking about um, challenging um, uh, decisions of the TRA or the Secretary of State. Okay, could we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so, um, the appeals process, now this uh, is defined by the upper tribunal rules. Um, so, just, just to note really, um, the deadlines are quite tight. Um, so, an appeal um, must be received by the upper tribunal within one month of the date of the decision. I mean, and it's the later of the date that the decision was published or that the decision comes into effect or if the decision isn't published, the date that the appellant is notified. But in essence, you have one month from the decision. Um, now that seems like quite a long time, but um, you know there are these are long investigations with like high volumes of information, um, lots and lots of submissions to consider. Uh, this is a novel new area of law, so um, you know complex legal arguments uh, to be made, and there is no sort of pre-action stage uh, set out. So. In, there is quite a lot of work to fit into that that early that first one month period in order to um, issue that appeal. Um, the timetable then rolls on in similar one month chunks. So once the appeal is um, received by the upper tribunal, it will then issue that to um, the Trade Remedies Authority or the Secretary of State, and they have one month um, after the upper tribunal has sent um, its notice in order in order for them to file their defence, in essence. And once the defence is filed, then the person or the party appealing or the parties then have a further month uh, in order to file a, a response to, to that defence. So the tribunal rules um, aren't especially um, prescriptive. They give quite a large margin of discretion to the tribunal, so broad um, case management powers in terms of how it's going to uh, deal with the appeals, um, which are particularly relevant to, for example, issues of disclosure, the filing of bundles, and, and so on. But one thing I think that is um, kind of important to highlight uh, is uh, the fact that the tribunal rules contain provisions about handling of confidential information. So obviously in a in a trans well, in a, a, any um, trade remedies investigation, there'll be kind of large volumes of, of confidential information as defined by, by the regulations, which parties do not want uh, to enter into the um, public sphere. Uh, so uh, while there are 
provisions um, for uh, marshalling that within the um, investigation regulations, the upper tribunal also has something similar. And so, as I say on the slide, the tribunal itself may order that certain documents need only be disclosed to them rather than to, to the world at large. So just some um, uh, something worthwhile being aware of there. Okay, uh, next slide, please. I think this is uh, my um, well, penultimate slide. So the outcomes of an appeal, well, um, as the reconsideration appeals regulations stipulates, the upper tribunal can either dismiss the appeal, um, in which case the decision that's being challenged will um, be upheld and, and remain as it is, or it can set aside the decision, the reconsidered decision, either in whole, either entirely, uh, or part of it. And that part which it um, sets aside, it will refer back to either the, the Trade Remedies Authority or the Secretary of State, whoever's decision it is that's being appealed, in order for them to remake the decision and, and remedy the, the public law error that was been identified by the, by the tribunal. Uh, final point uh, is on costs. I think this is really uh, critical uh, to be aware of. So in appeals before the upper tribunal, trade remedies appeals, uh, the general rule is that each party will bear their own costs. So that means um, a the party that loses won't be ordered to pay the costs, the legal costs uh, of the party uh, that wins the appeal. Now, the exception to this is um, if there are orders for wasted costs um, or for acting unreasonably in the proceedings and there's specific case law for that. But I mean, um, aside from that, the general position will be the parties only have to bear their own costs. So that reduces the risks uh, in financial terms of having to cover the costs of, of the other party. Okay, next slide, please. So finally, my last slide, just practical top tips. <clears throat> I think it's really important um, to uh, have some early planning, uh, given the tight timeframes that I mentioned and the breadth of the information considered and the arguments, the legal arguments that need to be developed and the lack of a sort of pre-action stage. I think it's important to, to start planning early. And that would mean uh, in general, during the, the reconsideration phase um, of, of these trade remedies investigations. I suppose as part of a, a subset of early planning, you know, I would suggest um, considering the litigation strategy. So, uh, as mentioned, there are you know two decisions that potentially the um, parties may wish to challenge, um, and various parties who may be involved. So, thinking about the litigation strategy early will be helpful, and this is something that Tom will talk more about. And then coordinating um, with parties who share similar interests and this may of course already be happening as part of the trade remedies investigation so early coordination um, joining up forces uh, may be something to consider and lastly and as i've tried to stress familiarization with public law principles really, really important to understand the public law nature of these challenges because that those are the grounds upon which these appeals can be brought and this is um, uh, what Sarah will be speaking about next. So that's it for me and I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much Daniel, thank you for that um, introduction to the legislation and thank you for um, inviting me to speak as well. As you can see my talk is on challenges um, applying judicial review principles and we're in the unusual situation for a talk that none of the challenges that we're talking about have yet been made under the UK trade remedies system. But no doubt we're at a stage where some will start to come through shortly. In essence, as I'm sure you all know, a trade remedies system involves investigations by an authority here, the Trade Remedies Authority, um, about ultimately whether or not the conditions for imposing such a remedy are met and what remedies should be imposed. In the United Kingdom, uh, imposition of remedies is subject to tests on economic interest, although there are presumptions in some cases, uh, and the Secretary of State must also look uh, before granting a remedy at both the economic interest and public interest tests that are set out in the legislation. So there are an investigation into a number of matters, factual and economic, um, which lead to determinations and recommendations to the Secretary of State in the case of remedies and then uh, if the Secretary of State decides to go ahead a, a determination by her uh, and as Daniel's pointed out there are therefore two potential targets for an appeal to the upper tribunal. So if I could look please at the first slide um, that sets out uh, the separate regulations for 
the TRA's decisions and the Secretary of State's decisions, Regulation 16 and Regulation 17, but also makes the point that both are in fact governed by Regulation 18. And the next slide, please, uh, sets out the principles that are be to, uh, to be applied. It states that the principles are to be those as would be applied by a court on an application for judicial review. As Daniel said, the purpose of my section of today's talk is to focus on what those principles are. I know they will be familiar to some and perhaps less familiar to others, but I'm going to outline them and, ha and highlight some particular aspects that have emerged in analogous situations. So moving to the next slide, please. Here I've set out the judicial review principles. The first point to make is that uh, traditionally, in relation to appeals against decisions of public bodies, legislation makes a choice between two standards of review. There are, in fact, some hybrids. But the first main standard would be to allow an appeal on the merits, in which case the question for the court is essentially whether the decision is clearly wrong, whether an alternative finding should have been made, an alternative solution or remedy preferred on the facts of the case. So it tends to be a much broader inquiry. The alternative chosen by the legislation in this case is the narrower judicial review process. And it's important to stress that this is generally about the legality of the decision making process itself rather than the merits. So there are four main aspects to this which I've set out here. I'm going to concentrate on the first while making reference to, to the second and third. The fourth is a fairly narrow ground which occurs where it's un uncontroversial that a mistake's been made, no party was responsible for it and uh, the court will decide to, to remedy the, the, the error. So going on to the next slide please, if I may. The most distinctive feature of the judicial review principles, and no doubt why the legislature has chosen it in this case, uh, is the rationality threshold, which is often described as being a matter of convincing the court or tribunal that a public body has made a decision which is outside the range of reasonable decisions that such a body, properly directed and taking into account all and only relevant considerations, could have made. So it's not enough that a court or tribunal would have preferred a different outcome or solution if it had made the decision. The decision must be irrational. Uh, and if it is, then it will be set aside and remitted back to the decision maker to make the decision again. So this approach takes account of the fact that there is really an expert body and in due course um, an experienced one that is the decision maker. And it's not the court or tribunal hearing the appeal. Another way in which it's frequently described is that the public body has a wide margin of appreciation in what it does. So as the slide says here, um, the CAT has made the point in merger cases particularly, but also in others, that it's a high hurdle to pass. Um, and in the slide, I've set out a couple of instances of, of what that may mean. Firstly, where the body has simply no evidence at all to support its conclusions or evaluations. So in a merger situation, for example, on a substantial lessening of competition, uh, where there's really no evidence about that, or that the evidence didn't lead reasonably to the conclusion that the body has come to. So did the body in question act rationally in concluding there was a sufficient basis for the view that it came to? So I was going to add a few extra points, really, in relation to this. Uh, first, an appeal court, or in this case, the upper tribunal, will bear in mind that the assessments may involve educated predictions of what may happen in the future, applying decision makers' experience and expertise, for example, in commercial or economic matters. And in those instances, the tribunal will be reluctant to interfere with the discretion of the decision maker to reach a view, reluctant to second guess it, in effect. This is quite a key point, and in fact, the extent to which that there is such a margin of appreciation is, is fact and context specific. So that there'll be a scale even within um, particular decisions and it will depend on whether the matter in issue sits towards the end of a broad margin uh, granted decision makers or not. So, for example, uh, thinking in a telecoms case, you know, there may be a number of imponderables about um, which Ofcom has to form specialist and technical judgment. Uh, or on which it itself has relied on expert judgment. Uh, those sorts of matters um, have been referred to in case law as, as being the sorts of things that might suggest a broad margin of appreciation. 
And in relation to trade remedies, one can perhaps hazard that evaluations such as the nature of the remedy or the effects of the economic interest test and presumptions and so on will be perhaps less easy to challenge if they're complex uh, th than other areas where there's perhaps less likely to be some discretion uh, accorded. In addition, uh, it may not matter that the decision maker changes its mind from a previous view or decision. I, I think um, a point's been made in, in other cases that where both decisions are reasonable decisions to have, to have made, it doesn't matter and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's irrational if, if a body takes a different view or changes its view. Um, one might think in a reconsideration or the Secretary of State taking a different view from the TRA. So those sorts of things uh, come into play. The fact that there are two different decisions doesn't necessarily help. It's just a question uh, of whether each decision was a reasonable one to reach. Uh, a further point, the Court of Tribunal will also not try to second guess evaluations of here the TRA on the question of what investigations it's necessary to make. Again, the standard to be applied is the rationality test. And in the BAA um, case referred to the market investigation, uh, the judge said there that the court would not intervene merely because it considers that further inquiries would have been desirable or sensible. It should intervene only if no reasonable relevant public authority could have been satisfied on the basis of the inquiries made. The very last point on this threshold that I wanted to draw attention to is the fact that despite um, the potential for a specialist composition of the tribunal, certainly the upper tribunal, I think, can sit with an experienced uh, member uh, in economic matters and so on uh, on its panel. Um, the tribunal still has to act in accordance with these ordinary principles of judicial review. In other words, although they may be more expert and slightly deferential to the decision maker's decision, the test about whether something is irrational uh, remains the same. If I could move then to the next slide, please. Having set that rather high bar, um, it is fair to say that not everything points in the direction of upholding the decisions of the TRA and the Secretary of State. It's important to remind ourselves, um, as stated here, that if the decision maker fails to determine the statutory questions in a rational or lawful manner, properly supported by the evidence and in a way that's sufficiently reasoned, then a challenge will succeed. Um, one of the particular uh, examples here, which I've put up, the JD Sports one, um, where the uh, CMA decided not to seek uh, further information despite on, on the impact of COVID, despite holding that it didn't have sufficient information in relation to that impact, um, was held to be irrational because it didn't have the statutory information, uh, the information required to answer the statutory test that it was required to answer. And the fact that there was a statutory time limit in that case didn't justify that decision, so the, the point was remitted. Um, on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is just uh, a reference to some comments in a case, Inclusion Housing, which, which is really pointing out that although there is a high hurdle, it is not meant to be so unrealistically high as to make a challenge effectively impossible. Um, and references often to unreasonable or perverse um, don't actually mean, uh, as, as Mr Justice said, Lee, as he then was said, decisions that are so bi bizarre that it must be regarded as temporarily unhinged. What, what you're really looking for is something which doesn't add up or um, lacks logic. On to the next slide, please. I said I'd mention very briefly other grounds, and here is one. This is really illegality, where um, the body here, the TRA, goes outside uh, the scope of its powers. For example, if it decided not to have regard to the statutory questions or any of the matters that um, it, it is required to have regard to, such as um, international law, uh, or misapplies thresholds, or statutory presumptions, or matters of that kind, or where there really is an error in relation to a fact um, which uh, gives it jurisdiction in the first place. Those sorts of uh, errors, uh, illegality errors, will lead to a successful challenge. If I could move on to the next slide, please. This slide deals um, with procedural issues, and again, that's another ground for a successful judicial review. Um, I, I've 
picked out here a, a certain uh, number of provisions, but there are others about procedures that the, the TRA has to follow. Uh, one can see that these deal with, in fact, all of these deal with the, giving people an opportunity to comment, to provide information, uh, in effect, to be consulted on a, on a statement of essential facts or, or in the safeguards and in, in the sort of intended final statement. So there are opportunities to comment and clearly if um, procedural matters go awry, then again, that gives basis uh, for, for a successful challenge. If I could then take the next slide, please. As Daniel has said, a particular feature of this legislation, which is perhaps slightly unusual, is the reconsideration step. Um, and that may uh, have the effect of solving certain matters, for example, procedural errors um, may, be, may, be, uh, may, may, may not occur in a second look. Um, there's a second team, as I understand, that looks at the reconsideration. So if, if, if matters be corrected in a, in a reconsideration, I'm sure parties would, would rather that than um, a, a longer challenge process to the upper tribunal. And I think only one other point about the reconsideration, uh, you know, whether it might be said that if two uh, separate teams have, have looked at something, come to the same results, does it then become slightly harder to show that something is irrational? Two of them would have had to have reached a, an unreasonable conclusion. But that doesn't necessarily follow and it will depend what the error um, that you can identify is. If I could then move to the last slide, please. And I just thought I hear I would include a reference to a successful challenge under the EU regime with, with a different review test, but each type of test is trying to modulate the extent to which discretion goes to the body making the trade remedies decision, in this case, the Commission and the Council regulations. This case was an anti-dumping case to do with imports of certain types of seamless pipes and tubes of iron or steel produced in China. The Commission had concluded that there was no material injury to the EU industry, but that there was a threat of such industry and imposed a remedy on that basis. Uh, the court sets out the usual broad discretion um, that, that appears under EU law, which, as I say, is a slightly different test, um, and then really sets aside the uh, Council's findings because it challenges the finding that there was a vulnerable situation on the basis that actually what the, what the uh, decision maker had done would had been to produce a decision not supported by concrete evidence, couldn't be inferred from the relevant um, economic factors and indices that it had looked at, contained contradictory findings and so on. So, and, and, and also had failed to take into account other explanations as to why um, market share, for example, had, had, had increased in a particular case. So, failures to do all of those sorts of things had led to a successful challenge. And, you know, one might say that those, those points lead clearly to a failure of logic um, and that similar challenges may well uh, succeed under the slightly different but analogous test in the United Kingdom. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and I'll hand over to Tom. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few practical considerations uh, that are likely to arise as this um, new jurisdiction takes off. Uh, it's a real privilege uh, to speak to all of you and thanks for the invitation. The first point I'd like to make is that as a practical matter, there's always a choice of remedies in these cases. For the exporter, at least, they have the choice of getting their government to go to the WTO and um, often there's a trade-off to be made about whether you're going to sink resources domestically or in the WTO. The sort of traditional way of looking at that issue was to say that going to the WTO has the advantage that the, at least compared to many domestic courts, the WTO was less deferential to investigating authorities. The big difference or the big disadvantage was that there were no retroactive remedies in the WTO. So you could never receive refunds of overpaid duties from the WTO while in many domestic systems you could get that. That was sort of the, um, the standard way of looking at, at that question. Uh, I think that's all a bit uh, messed up at the moment uh, because the WTO's panel system 
isn't really functioning for a pretty broad range of members, uh, including theoretically the, the UK. And the assumption that WTO panels would be less deferential than domestic courts is something that's uh, probably likely to come under some pressure simply because of uh, US unhappiness at uh, the lack of deference shown by the WTO uh, historically. So that's up in the air, but we should always remember that at least for an exporter, uh, there is always uh, a choice that they have to make uh, at this stage. And I think the key element for that choice, um, at least the, the key element for deciding whether to go for a domestic remedy is the degree of deference that's going to be given to the investigating authority, which has been the focus of what um, Sarah spoke about and, and even Daniel. Uh, so turning on to that, uh, deference will obviously be the key issue. Uh, there's uh, every reason to expect that the upper tribunal and the UK courts generally will be quite deferential to the investigating authority. Uh, in, in these cases, there is a spectrum of issues that arise. Uh, the sort of causation and injury issues that arise are the ones where you usually see the most deference and where it's extremely hard to overturn an investigating authorities' decision simply because injury itself is such a manable concept. Um, things usually improve or are a bit easier uh, when you look into trigger conditions, uh, such as increased imports or whether there's a margin of dumping or whether there's uh, and subsidization is usually extremely straightforward. Uh, but uh, on that, the investigating authority has to make uh, a pretty fundamental error of fact, which, uh, although it's, it's probably going to be easier to show that causation injury is is not uh, straightforward. And again, there's 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 no real reason to think that it will be an easy task for exporters or the domestic industry to reverse those sorts of judgments. Uh, the third area, which is usually the area that is the most fruitful, is errors of procedure, uh, especially errors involving recourse to facts available when you're faced with a recalcitrant exporter. Um, that, that's always been um, an important area. In, in the UK, it will be very important to see how the investigating authority deals with non-cooperation, and in particular, whether it uses uh, unreal uh, assumptions to punish non-cooperation, or whether it um, aligns itself uh, with a more sort of objective view of what actually happened. Uh, and that's a trade-off, or that's a choice that every investigating authority has to face. And it will be interesting to see where the UK ends up there. But nevertheless, there's, uh, there's, I think, from an exporter's point of view, there's uh, no reason to think that this would be a very fertile area for challenge compared to other jurisdictions. It's uh, the UK has very well developed uh, due process requirements and a strong administrative culture. So all of that sort of points towards, at the moment, we haven't seen. Uh, the, the results of investigations, but it points towards quite a high bar um, for for persons who are seeking to overturn these uh, decisions in terms of deference. Now, having said that, what we've discussed so so far is deference in the traditional judicial review or the appeal process. The first instance reconsideration by the TRA itself is quite unique. Um, I think Australia is the other major jurisdiction that does that. Uh, judicial review constraints don't apply there. And it remains to be seen how the reconsideration unit will treat um, its task. It certainly uh, has the ability to go straight into the merits. Quite uniquely, it seems, uh, I think, in sharp contrast to Australia, although I might 
not uh, have understood the position fully, uh, it seems to be able to reopen the record and admit new evidence. Uh, so that might be sort of the um, the area that un unhappy parties or sort of the avenue that unhappy parties focus on. And it's a novel, it's a novel procedural option and one that we'll really have to watch carefully. And it will be very interesting to see how the bureaucratic culture develops there. It is, it is an unusual sort of um, administrative structure to adopt. Uh, arguably, it just uh, lengthens the process without m much advantage. But we'll just have to see how how, how things work out in 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 the um, uh, in in the years ahead. The third point I I wanted to discuss was economic evidence. The as things currently stand, um, it seems unlikely that at least at the judicial review stage new economic evidence will play a massive role. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how things will pan out, but if if you're before a decision, if you're before a judge who's supposed to defer to the authority uh, and you need to show uh, when it's pretty unreasonableness, uh, it probably isn't a very good starting point to have a battle of the experts. And the reality is when the judicial review standard uh, applies, it is relatively rare to have expert evidence and cross-examination of experts in that situation. It's not unheard of, and I understand that uh, the CAT has allowed it uh, on restricted grounds in, in some uh, competition cases that involved uh, a judicial review standard, but this is unlikely to be uh, a fertile strategy uh, for person seeking to challenge what the uh, what the investigating authority has done, but we'll have to wait and see. Of course, that's quite distinct from deploying economic evidence uh, before the authority in, in your first attempt and deploying economic evidence uh, during the reconsideration. Um, it's likely to uh, economists, uh, economists are likely to play a very important uh, role at, at those stages. What, what we need to see is whether they'll play uh, an important role when when we come to judicial review. We've also got, uh, I mean, one one big variable is the degree of ex non-legal expertise that will staff these cases in the upper tribunal. Uh, we've, we're familiar with the phenomenon of uh, less deference being paid uh, by the CAT to questions that involve economists simply because they have lay members who have a lot of economic expertise and uh, are probably less inclined to be deferential, even though they're applying the same judicial review standard. And it remains to be seen how this would play out for the upper tribunal. Although there is one sharp differentiator, I think, between competition cases and trade remedies cases, which is the economics of competition is pretty well established and pretty sensible. While if you ask um, a, a well-trained economist whether trade remedies make much sense, uh, they're unlikely to uh, to uh, sort of adopt that view. There, there isn't a sort of good, strong, coherent economic justification for the trade remedies disciplines uh, in the WTO agreement. So. That, that that may mean that uh, you, you have e economists who are not terribly interventionist, even if they end up um, hearing some of these cases as, as part of, uh, um, as uh, uh, on the upper tribunal. Um, there are just two final practical points uh, I, I wanted to make. One was, uh, this will invariably be a multi-party situation and you, you'll have one or the other, the export or the domestic industry aligned with the uh, investigating authority. And there are lots of tactical issues that come up when you have that configuration in litigation. Uh, if, if you're the, the aligned third party, uh, it's important to work out whether you, you keep quiet or whether you take a more extreme position 
than the investigating authority and it's very important to try and coordinate as far as possible so that that's something to uh to remember for these cases and finally because it's judicial review it will have a structure that's very similar to wto litigation in that you need to think ahead about how the error you've identified is going to change the concrete result in the long term because most of these cases will be remanded back and the question is how far are you really constraining the investigating the investigating authority so there is um, that tactical dynamic which is familiar from both domestic judicial review and the wto where we have prospective remedies uh, those were the practical considerations i i wish to raise um, and i look forward to uh, for the discussion thanks Thanks very much, Tom. Um, so yes, now just moving on to the uh, Q&A uh, se session. So just um, taking a look at the uh, questions that have come in. Uh, so one is uh, on um, judicial reviews. So uh, we mentioned judicial reviews. Um, how does the judicial reviews fit in with the appeal process? Um, Sarah, would you like to comment on that? Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the thrust of my talk was about the use of judicial review principles in the appeal itself. So w what I addressed was the appeal of either a decision by the TRA or the Secretary of State, uh, which goes off to the upper tribunal using the mechanism that Daniel spoke of. Uh, and, and actually then the standard or the intensity of review that the um, tribunal then applies and that feeds in also to the points that Thomas made about um, how <laughs> how easy or difficult it is to uh, identify an error and to, and to get a tribunal to um, do anything other than defer to the decision to the TRA or the Secretary of State. So th th that's really where the judicial review principles apply in the main. It's also possible, I mean, it's, cha it's possible to challenge various other decisions other than the final decision under the regulations um, that are set out uh, in in relation to trade remedies in the UK. It, it may be that if there are other features that fall uh, outside those specific points, it might be possible to go off to the High Court and seek a judicial review in a particular case, but I think that will depend on the circumstances. Um, uh, normally, you would not expect that to stop uh, the process of whatever it is that's going on in the investigation um, and the taking of the decision. So. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I mean, I, I would just also add, uh, having kind of uh, look, looked at this when I was at the TRA, um, thinking about, well, what you know, is it likely to they're going to get flooded with judicial reviews and, and appeals at the same time? And um, just thinking about you know potential defences to judicial review challenges, um, uh, an important one being. Um, that if you're going to, uh, if there's an effective appeal process uh, in it, at the end of the investigation, then um, it's unlikely we think that the, we thought that the High Court would um, accept a judicial review or grant permission for a judicial review. So I, I would just add, because I haven't worked in government for um, about 10, 12 years before joining Field Fisher, you know, judicial review is something that always exists in the background for government uh, departments, um, public bodies like TRA, so it's, a, it's a means by which their decisions can be challenged. Um, and, and so because of the nature of TRA or, or the, of course, the, the Secretary of State, uh, their decisions are um, amenable to being challenged through judicial review. But because of this fairly comprehensive uh, appeals process, uh, it's probably, uh, unlikely that judicial reviews will um, gain much traction or take up much space uh, and appeals are more likely to kind of feature I would have thought. Um, so another question um, maybe relating to what you were speaking about there Tom, um, so what expertise does the upper tribunal or judges at the upper tribunal what, uh, have to deal with complex trade remedies appeals? Um, I guess you said they were um, maybe more likely to be deferential at this stage if they don't have much expertise, is that right? Yeah, it's very unlikely that anyone has any specific expertise given that this hasn't been a uh, part of the landscape of um, UK legal practice. There, there be, might be some general expertise about economics, but that's probably as far as it goes. I mean, tax expertise isn't really of much help in this area. 
Yeah, I, I, I wonder, do you, is there much likely, do you think that they'll bring experts on board as part of the panel in the, in the, at the upper tribunal? I, I mean, that's possible, uh, but I, I think, I guess the point is the only sort of experts you can really find would be general economists. I mean, I think you would really struggle to find uh, trade remedies experts. And I don't know any jurisdiction that deploys trade remedies experts, so to speak. You know, they're, the closest you have is the U.S. Court for International Trade, and they're not necessarily, you know, they're generalist New York judges. Um, they're sort of public law crime judges who, who, who learn the stuff on the job, but it seems seems unlikely that you would get you know an ex-investigator or something this mm. just seems difficult practically yeah but, i mean I, yeah i'm just not yeah i'm not familiar enough with how they would deploy uh, and get expertise yeah absolutely yeah remain remains to be seen um i guess in that case leaves a, a lot of scope for um counsel such as yourselves to walk um the judges through uh trade remedies uh kind of concepts and and the legislation i suppose um so definitely um more room there um to, to kind of educate i guess the judiciary um a, a third uh, question i've got is um so if appealable decisions come at the end of investigations uh, but companies are suffering during the course of investigations what relief can be sought um in the interim so um I, a bit of a technical question there but um i mean injunctions potentially i suppose um sarah do you have any any thoughts on that or? yeah i mean i think i think the general idea is that things are not su are not suspended you know, everything just continues until you've had a decision overturned um but yes i mean you, you can i think go and um try and make a case for an interim injunction presumably from the upper tribunal i think they have certainly have jurisdiction to to deal with those so i think that would be what you would aim to do. Um, again, I think it's given the high hurdle and you know, the difficulty of uh, upsetting what, what's currently in place, it, it may be difficult, but um, it will depend on the facts and it can be looked at, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose um, potentially the other thing that just occurs to me is um, the possibility to impose um, provisional measures by the investigating authority. Um, is that something you, you, you see often, Tom, in, in your past experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, yes, that's relief to the domestic industry and it's it's just a very common feature of the landscape. I think the, the, the question, um, I suppose the question is concerned about um, relief to exporters when they disagree with what the investigating authority has done. That's far rarer. I mean, it's, I, I haven't come across a stay of a, of a trade remedies measure pending the domestic review. The, the, you're lucky. You're, you're lucky if you get a refund, um, <laughs> by which time your, your business is already in a lot of trouble. Mm. Yeah, and I was actually just taking a look at the um, the repayment investigations that the TRA has the power to run as well. So, I mean, maybe not necessarily on this specific point, but if there is um, a, a valid claim for um, exporters, foreign exporters or, or, or the importers themselves um, to uh, make a, a claim for repayment because they've been over overpaying for whatever reason, potentially because um, the uh, tariff imposed is unlawfully high, then then there is a, a mechanism in place for um, an application for a, a repayment um, investigation. So no doubt uh, we'll see the TRA um, dealing with those in, in due course. Okay, I think um, we're at 12.59, so um, those, that's kind of all the time we have uh, for questions. Um, uh, I, I hope that's been informative um, for everyone out there. Um, uh, as you can see on this slide, our contact details are there.
um, and uh, we'll be circulating um, the, the recording of this webinar plus the slides to um, all attendees afterwards. So please don't um, hesitate to get in contact with um, us if you have any further questions uh, on, on this uh, or any kind of appeals that are on, on your mind. Um, I'd like to very much thank um, both Sarah and Tom for uh, being on the panel for this uh, webinar um, and um, I wish uh, everyone a good afternoon and enjoy the good weather. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone.